Live from the Hilton at Bonnet Creek, Orlando, Florida, extracting the signal from the noise, it's the Cube, covering Vision 2015. Brought to you by IBM. And now your hosts, Dave Vellante and Jeff Frick. We're here live at IBM Vision 2015 in Orlando. Mina Wallace is here with Neil Dodgson. Mina is the Vice President of Risk Analytics, and Neil heads up Client Solutions. Folks, welcome to theCUBE. It's good to see you. Thank you. you. Hi, Steve. Old friends, yeah, sort of. how are you? <laughs> yeah, great, great to see you. So, Mina, let's start with you. Um, risk Analytics, what's the state of, of risk analytics today? What's the state of risk in general? Then we can get into the analytics piece. Well, you know, I would say that, yeah, I mean, we've been in business for a long time on the risk side, and I would say there's a tremendous amount of momentum in risk nowadays. Uh, it's a focus at the boardroom level. It's a focus at the front line level. It's just very topical throughout the whole organization. You know, we're with IBM, and it's not that typical, actually, for, for an IBM conference to have such a strong focus on risk but through the acquisitions that IBM has done over the last number of years, the area of risk is becoming more important to IBM and we're just seeing a tremendous amount of momentum. Now Mina, did you come in with, with a, an acquisition or? I did come in with an acquisition, a uh, financial risk company called Algorithmics and... Um, right, okay. Up in about four years ago. Out of Toronto, a lot of companies in Toronto and Ottawa that were acquired by IBM. Yeah, That's was, true. That's <laughs> a, absolutely true. You and guys then, are the crazy hockey fans, or uh, we we we're crazy hockey fans with not the greatest hockey team. I don't know if that's going to go viral on here or not. I, I'm, not I'm from London, so we don't follow ice hockey whatsoever. So I'm, sorry I'm from Boston, topic. and we do, and we're we're. Lamenting. Yeah, <laughs> I know, I know. We so, won't mention yeah. the New England Patriots and what they've been doing. At least yeah. Really. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's in you the news. Your, you know, you yeah. they say there's no such thing as bad press. So. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So Neil, what's your role? Um, I run the customer solutions group globally. So um, I have a team of risk subject matter experts. I think risk is one word, but within risk, risk management, there are many, many different lines of business which you would know about because you do risk management on your own accounts. I mean, we do it, you go on holiday, you look at the foreign exchange rate, that's risk management. You've got a, if you've got a mortgage, if you've got a kid's school fund, you're all taking decisions on risk management. So it's across a wide spectrum. So I've got a team of SMEs, we go into clients, we find out what their problems are, and we try and help them solve them. Simple as that, it's going to be yes. more easy. So, so the, the conversation on risk has is, is evolved, let's just say. So, Maybe 10 years ago, nobody was talking about, even five years ago, nobody was really talking about the opportunities associated with, it, with analytics. It was all about risk, 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 risk. And there's kind of a more of a balance now, um, which I think is a good thing. I, I, I wonder if you could comment on that, the, the, the balance sheet, if you will, between risk and reward. How do you, how do you see that within organizations? Now, you're focused on the risk side, I know, um, well, let me start with who do you who do you deal with? Is it the general counsel? Is it the CEO? Is it the board? All of the above? The risk professionals? You know, the, yeah. I mean, there's a very strong risk uh, subject matter experts in financial in organizations today. So there's a chief risk officer, undoubtedly. It used to be that perhaps that function rolled up into a finance function. But that's very rare now. You would so find it's a separate function. You'd now. find it very mm -hmm. much a separate function, and now you have a chief data officer because data is such has such an impact across the organization. Certainly, an impact on risk. So that's another individual that might be involved in this conversation. Um, audit and compliance function might be part of risk. Might be a separate function reporting up and sometimes into the general counsel. So yeah, it can do, be yeah. kind of you know, I don't know. The number of risk professionals really has exploded if you look at who great might news describe for themselves. Pardon? Great news for a software company. Yeah, it is great news for a software company. No, um, I think it, I, I was sitting, well, because we did the plenary speech uh, and, and we had a panel discussion, and I was wondering why risk now in financial services is so in vogue. And you know, if you look at other industries, the airline industry, pharmaceutical industry, the energy industry, they run massive risks. But what's the difference between them and financial services is, they actually affect people's lives. So if you have a major disaster, you know, an aircraft goes down, 
you produce a wrong drug. It was then only in 2008 that the risk came into affecting people's lives in financial services when actual we had banks collapse, hedge funds go down, asset managers go down and that's when it had a real tangible impact and I think that's what's yeah. made a major impact. It now affects and you go to, if you go and look at Greece there were people because of Greece, there were people in Greece because they were so bankrupt were committing suicide on the streets just as a protest against what had happened in the financial markets and I think that's why the regulators now yeah. have got really tough and why we're seeing what we're seeing. So Mina, you mentioned the chief data officer so I mean typically you think of a, a CDO in highly regulated industries, financial services, healthcare, government, is that sort of where you're, are those your peeps, you know, your, your homies, if you will, or is it more broad based? Well, ours, ours is really the chief compliance officer yeah. now at the moment. But, but sure. I mean, within those industries, is it is it those industries that are more sort of risk aware, or is it more broad based? Are you in terms well, of where you penetrate? you know wherever there's regulation, yeah. there's going to be the the need for for risk management, and there's regulation across most industries nowadays. I think the point that Neil was making is a really important one in that. The, you know, when you regulate something for the safety of your clients or your passengers or, or whatever, that's a different kind of thing than regulating it for the, the financial well-being of your client. Yeah, it's you know, it's yeah. a less tangible impact. So I think what what financial services is being asked to do by the regulators now is really is really pr protect them from some catastrophic failure which, you know, losing their pensions. You know, mm. we had some examples in, you know, of some of the untoward gentlemen in, uh, in New York who was basically had Ponzi schemes that basically wiped out the savings of people. You know, you just can't let that happen. And there's really no regulation in the past that would, that would prevent that from happening. And so regulators have sort of swooped in and they're making all of these require these demands on organizations to comply with these things. Which is driving us to build solutions that enable, you know, enabling technology mm -hmm. to help Absolutely. that. So I see. So the, you say the nuance there is versus say some kind of you know transportation disaster where lives are at stake. Healthcare is kind of a two two headed animal there, yeah. isn't it? A two headed monster with regard to people's lives, but also privacy. Yeah, um, the privacy is a big thing in financial services as well. Absolutely. But you made a comment earlier that I'd just like to go back to. You said you know the last ten years this things changed and what's different or the last hmm. five years. I would say the big difference that I've observed even in the last 12 months is, is predictive, is the yes, ability is, to look yeah. in the future. So it's not good enough to establish, you know, risk to, you know, to make sure that you're well looked after, but it's really important, like they talk about systemic risk, but what if this, this bank had a failure? What then would happen to all the other institutions if that bank had, a, you know, failed? And so, you know, looking into the future at what might happen if certain, ca you know, certain kinds of things happen, interest rates fall, commodity prices fall, and so you want to look at your portfolio for your individual uh, account holders or for your funds that you're managing, you know, from a predictive perspective. I think that's the biggest change I've seen. It is. I mean, that's, I mean, for best practices, they should be doing that. It's financial planning. Yeah. Um, but now we have strict regulations around the world that you have to, especially in the US, your, your regulators have got really tough over here. So there's, there's we, we, we are prone to knee-jerk reactions over here. So <laughs> well, I think Lehman's might have had a lot to do with that <laughs> yeah. in 2008. But um, no, they really, um, now with the CCAR and the DFAST, you have to do forward projections and you have to submit your plans and also the concept now of living wills. So you have to tell the regulator and the public how you would pay them off if you started to go insolvent. And there's specific rules around it now, very rigorous rules. So it's more than just process, I'm hearing. It's substantive. Oh yes, it is, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's yeah. totally substantive. And, and because, again, five, seven years ago, it, you, could, you really couldn't provide the substance because the technology wasn't there to support it. But now you get things like Watson that allow you to do more predictive analytics and other technologies as well, not just Watson. I think five or seven years ago, the boardroom conversation would have been a documentation of historical things that happened. Why did that thing happen? Yeah. You know, and they would describe why it happened. Whereas now, if you look at some of our, you know, leading edge clients, some of the clients that are here at the session this week, they're they're on the board agenda 
every agenda. They're part yeah. of the board package. They're showing, the, the board members are engaged in the process and understanding business unit to business unit, product line to product line, where the risks are, what the issues are year over year, or month over month, and, and it becomes, it's a very, very much a fabric of the conversation. And, and to do that, you needed all the data, but you, you need the technology to get at the data, but you need also the culture within the organization to make that, that a point of view that everybody is, is taking an interest in and accountable for. And, and that's, I think, the leading, you know, how many organizations would be like that? Maybe 10% or something? Yeah, not I don't that know. many like, at all. Not that sure. many, you know, so they're, they're really at the leading edge of things. Is it, is it fair to say that, that the, the risk discussion used to be, a lot of it anyway, centered on sort of physical events that could happen, disasters that could happen, and the probability of those occurring, which would be based upon looking back, as you were saying, yeah, well, yeah. how often did it happen in the last 50 years? And yeah, yes. What's the expected loss, uh, disaster, you know, how, many, how often is it going to occur in the next 10 years, kind of thing, versus now sort of, you know, interdependencies in the financial services system, um, other sort of blind spots maybe? But, but, that, but that's where I think, well, I'm probably more excited than others about Watson and Watson Analytics and what that can do because, if you do go back to 2008, 2008 was a, was a smoking sort of dormant volcano, but there was lots of indicators which were leading up to what was happening in the financial markets. Now you would hope that if that data was feeding in, Watson could look at it now and predict what conditions would actually start to lead to those that financial crisis, and then potentially they could avoid it. Yeah. So I'm really, I, I think Watson makes risk management really sexy. Was, it, was the financial crisis, though, in some regards, like a failure to act? I mean, people had the information. They just sort of chose to ignore it or sort of no. smoke wow. their own well, that, rhetoric? That, or, a, or was it really a black swan event that wasn't I would like to think this of it more of an ostrich event where people were burying their head in the sand oh, and yeah. chosen to ignore it. Yeah. It was a black swan event, obviously. Um, but look, you know, we had, you had those things called ninja mortgages in the U.S. No income, yeah. no assets, yeah. no job. I yeah. mean, does it take a sophisticated Watson or a sophisticated risk manager to, to say, oh, I wouldn't lend it. They're yeah. called teenage yeah. kids, aren't they? And we don't lend them money. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, so, so there's, an, there's a good example. Yes, it's a, 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 as you're saying, it's a black swan event, although by definition, black swan events aren't supposed to be predictable, but this one was. So Watson, could Watson have helped us Clearly, it could have right, with this black swan event. Right. Talk it, about it. Could, I think it could start to pick up warning signs yeah. and, and correlate those warning signs early on as to what was happening in the market. I mean, we, we've gone to go into the details of what was being seen, but rumors around the market that this, there was a discourse between some of the interest rates around the world and all this, and no one understood why it was happening. And, and visualizing the interdependencies yeah. is something that you can bring to the table yeah. now, right? That's, where does visualization play in risk management? Well, it's, it's become more and more important now. I mean, you've got paper on your desk there, but uh, I said it in, in earlier that now all of the board of directors, they use iPads. Yeah. I know it's a paperless boardroom um, in the, most of the banks, you know, the top tier banks now. So they're all wanting visualization on, on the iPad. They all want to be able to drill down in a report. They all want to do their nice snazzy and... Um, yeah, what's behind this number? Yeah, yeah, to, exactly, you want, yeah. Yeah, you want to look at, look at exceptions and you want to drill down into exceptions and understand it. So but nobody it, it, wants a... It, it's now got to, to, to I don't know, in, in the US, but in the UK, a, a NED, non-executive director, was the cushiest job you could have. You got paid 250,000 pounds a year. Four times a year, you turned up for a board meeting. You read the papers and it was a nice club. Now that they're, they're actually, if they've signed it off or not recognized it, they can go to jail. Yeah. So, so, so you've got actual non-executive directors resigning from organizations because they don't want it. So they've got to, as you say, you've got to challenge, be able to visualize it, be able to look at it, drill down, find out what it is, and, and, and raise that sort of issue within the organization. So what are the products behind all this? You guys are marketing. Well, we've got a product called Open Pages, and Open Pages is sort of the, the the platform that allows you to collect all the information and establish all of your key risk indicators and controls and so on. But in addition to the platform, you have Watson Cognitive Analytics that we're using as the is really to extract the value out of that data. I mean, at the end of the day, the last I don't know decades has been about collecting data from the right sources 
making sure you have controls and that sort of thing, automating processes, but it's really the ability to extract the data and visualize it. So Watson Analytics, Cognos 10.2 is is really an interesting product. <laughs> Why are you smiling, Dave? No, Bill just texted me. <laughs> oh, <did he? laughs> Tell mine I said Because hi. I knew that that wasn't that. <laughs> My brother says hello. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that what I was saying was not causing a smile on your face, but anyway, no one ever smiles when you talk about risk management. Oh, Cognos 10.2, ha ha It's a very somber, pro it's a very somber topic, actually. <laughs> risk, right, you can't smile when you talk about risk. <laughs> Okay, so yeah. so you've got so OpenPage is one of the few companies that you acquired that aren't in, based in Canada, right? Wasn't that a yeah, Walter that was company? Boston, yeah, yeah Boston exactly. Based, so yeah. we mer like actually we're the result of the merger between OpenPages and Algorithmics because there's a I lot see. of value between the governance that you the governance capabilities of OpenPages as it relates to financial risk and and really looking at those two things together. So it was it's actually it was a brilliant move. By IBM Inspired, to bring predictive, these. wasn't it really? It was actually, yeah. it was predictive. And then you layer on top of that the analytic capabilities that are are more part of the traditional IBM, you know, in terms of Cognos and SPSS and, and now Watson, onto, you know, you know, best of breed solutions that are managed risk already. You add on that ability to analyze and visualize data. It's it's a really powerful, we think very unique value proposition. Well, I mean, you have observed the software industry and its changes over the years. Um, and IBM was, you know, pre-Cognos was nowhere in this business, didn't have any assets, yeah, and yeah. now it's number one. Yeah. How do you get all the assets working together? Is that something that you're cloudifying? Is that a challenge for customers? Um, you know, I think if you talk to customers, I think customers will say that that is a challenge, and so clearly it's something that we have to do a better job of. There, we went through a reorganization earlier this year, which one of our executives might have been talking to you about today. Solutions offering. So how do you take a step back and you sort of look across the boundaries of your different assets and say, what combination of assets can we bring together to, for the greater good? And that's actually a very positive move um, as opposed to you know, when you acquire a company, how do you really best integrate it? And if you can integrate it in a way that does leverage the assets across the portfolio, that's that's pretty powerful. So we, well, we see that happening. Well, no more. doubt. And IBM's been a has got a great track record of acquiring companies. I mean, picking up companies at great value. Cognos was a big, I probably probably IBM's largest acquisition. One of the biggest. One Maybe of the largest. PwC I think. Was, yeah, was big. Well, PwC. Yeah, PwC would Maybe have been. Maybe it was bigger, but um, 4.9 billion for Cognos. Yeah. 1.2 billion for SPSS. Two large yeah. acquisitions, but lots and lots of other tuck-ins yeah. that you've now yeah. Yeah. cobbled together to create this this powerhouse. I wonder. I should ask Bob Picciano if, he's, if you guys yeah. used analytics to figure out okay, the organization, right? Yeah. Yeah, you should ask. You should ask Bob. Important. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be a number of times. I'll ask him at Insight. Yeah, the next no, time I see him. That's a good, so, uh, yeah. How the decision was made as to how to organize. Yeah. You know, because get that right, and good things can happen, right? But well, the, the, the interesting thing is that where we come from in, in terms of the risk analytics group is we've always sold solutions rather than products. So we can take many of our products and we can solve the solution of, of the particular um, financial institution and. Um, We've now had this year with the announcements from Ginny in Q1 that we've now gone to a much more of a, of a solution-based approach to IBM in the analytics yeah, division. Yeah. So really for us now, you know, it's opening up lots and lots of doors for us, more than we had over the previous two years with the acquisition side. Well, I think that's an imperative for IBM personally, I've said. I mean, IBM made a you know, great business out of taking complexity and, and bringing services you know, to the fore, but the world is changing, and IBM still has a great services business. There's tons of the complexity to solve, but people want to buy solutions. You must be seeing that in your your client base. I mean, right? Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, again, we come from the background where we're we we're used to selling solutions. So when I talk about assets, I mean whether it's a serve. You know, you have to bundle the combination of things to say this is it all works. See, I'm not just going to give you a piece of the solution, and you figure it out. Figure out how to make it actually work for your business. We're really bundling it together to say, you've got a business problem and this this is what's going to solve that specific business problem. That's actually a new development for, for, for IBM as opposed to, here's a piece of technology, 
that's going to be one of the pieces of the, that that help you solve your problem. Mm. So, so it is. A, it's a cultural change. I mean, yeah, I think that's one of Jenny's challenges with all of us is to sort of make that cultural chi shift. But uh, you know, I'm going to go back ask Bob this question. I think that what analytics is used for, for sure, in IBM is to analyze market trends and market growth and so on and so forth. So. As an example, recently we're working, we're in a competitive situation, and the the executives from the this organization said, "Well, how important is this to IBM? I mean, IBM, you know, a hundred billion dollar company, and you know, how important is this particular solution line to to IBM?" And so the answer we gave is, "The market is booming for this solution line, <laughs> so therefore we know it's not just because." you know, IBM is investing in us and we think it's important. The market is growing and IBM is knows the market isn't growing, so that's the place that they want to be. And that was what the customer really wanted to hear. They don't want to hear that, they know that IBM is not going to spend a lot of money in a shrinking market. So, what, so back to the analytics question, do they know the market, you know, do they do a lot of analysis around the market trends and what's growing and what's not growing and what industry, um, areas they should be investing in, you know, absolutely, and that's kind of where you'll, in compliance and risk is one of the growing markets. So, so I, IBM wants to be there. Well, you know, healthcare is another one, and the, and IBM will talk about healthcare. Well, the st stakes are very high. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and it's, uh, facts are really good, but one of the um, rather global banks said that between somewhere between 70 80 percent of, of this year's IT budget was going to be related to GRC issues. Now that could be security, it, it could be the GRC, the controls and the compliance. That's a huge amount of money. And that's one of the reasons why IBM wants to be in that space yeah. in financial services. It's not just financial services, it's say we're in healthcare, we're also in the energy industry as well, we can provide solutions in that. So um, it's exciting times at the moment. Well, really I, I sort of say the stakes are very, very high, you know, for, for corporations, they're sitting on a lot of cash, brand value, large market caps that can really be affected by yeah. these events. But I'll make a prediction, you ain't seen nothing yet. I, because the I, minute I couldn't agree more. we are living in an environment of such low interest rates that certainly, you know, if I, you turn to your kids and say, hey, interest rates at 7%, they're going to look at you like you're some sort of what? The minute we start to see the Federal Reserve tightening the interest rates, yeah. the shock waves around the market. We've seen, I don't know if you know, realize, the turmoil in the markets at the moment because of the expectation on the Federal Reserve. People are pulling money out of the emerging markets. So there's, there's something going to come up in the next couple of years. Well, uh, geopolitical factors. But still sleep um, at night, don't worry about that. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's, why, that's why you guys are here. <laughs> oh, yes. Mina and Neil, thanks very much for coming to theCUBE. It was really a pleasure having you. Oh, yeah, no, it's a Thanks a lot. Keep right there, buddy. We'll be back to wrap right after this. This is theCUBE. We're live from IBM Vision. We'll be right back. <laughs>